there are two types of resources in uh, general. So CPU is an active resource that can be used only by one runtime entity, uh, can be multiplexed in time. Memory can be thought of as a passive resource. So CPU is an active resource, memory is a passive resource. When I say passive resource, that means it's a capacity based. Uh, you, it, it's a bag with a certain number of units and essentially sharing it amongst multiple runtime entities at the same time. So it's kind of multiplexed in space. So CPUs are multiplexed in time, scheduling, memory is multiplexed in space, some amount of space is allocated for each thread or process. Okay, another question that arises with passive uh, resources is, like memory is how do you protect tasks from each other? So essentially the, the thing you have to deal with is protection of memory. P protection of memory just deals with the notion that each task does not have access to all of memory. Okay, So if you have a certain amount of memory and you vendor out a certain chunk to each process, how do you make sure that one process does not inadvertently or uh, purposefully you know clobber other tasks memory okay then there's protection of IO devices how do you make sure that when two tasks print issue jobs to the printer at the same time what you don't get out is gobbled output that is each task kind of looks like it has exclusive access to the device and there's also a notion of some devices shouldn't be accessible to all tasks for example if a browser can arbitrarily print out things um, to the printer that's connected to your machine, uh, then a lot of bad things can happen. Then there's a the protection of CPU itself, which is essentially deals with how do you make sure that one task does not, does not monopolize the whole system, right? How do you make sure that if if you gave the CPU to one task, it just keeps running forever and ever without ever giving the CPU up for in, to anyone else? And the way we deal with that is typically to use timer interrupts, right? So we use uh, as kind of an alarm system that triggers periodically, and the OS kicks in at that point and says, oh, okay, you've had the CPU for this amount of time, I'm going to give it out to the next person, okay? And obviously, if the timer was, alarm system could be disabled by the, the application itself, then this would be bad, right? Because then the application would just disable the alarm and then keep running forever. So the, in this case, the timer itself is inaccessible from application code. Just to make it clear, the notion of a task here refers to a runtime entity can be either a thread or a process. We'll get to the differences between the two in a second. Okay, all right. So what we're gonna do now is first review what an address space is. So what does uh, the address, when I say address space of a process, what do I mean? And then we're gonna deal with threads and processes and what are sh what's actually shared, what's the difference between the two. The address space essentially refers to a set of accessible addresses that is program states that's associated with a given task. So essentially it's all the variables, all the uh, variables that you allocate, all the state, everything that you use to store anything meaningful in the program. Typically it's referred to in the form of addresses and if you have a 32-bit processor, then you can name four billion different entities, which is why you have four gig, um, four gigabytes. Today's systems you have 64 bits, which means you can name up to, um, you know, lots of terabytes, uh, hundreds of terabytes of uh, of addresses, and you use these addresses to store things in them. Okay. Not all the addresses in a program are the same. So there are different forms of data structures and which are used to store different forms of data. And we look at what each one is used for. Primarily, there are four of them. There's the stack, which is mainly used for functions and for short lifetime temporary data. There's the heap, which is used to store global variables, which is sh um, shared by lots of threads and is used to store information that's going to be persistent pretty much for the a lot, a lot, long lifetime and where data is not freed unless you explicitly done so. Then there's the data segment which refers to constants, other things you've not allocated but are global and are shared. And then there's the text segment which essentially refers to the instructions and all the other um, things like your TCB, all the things that go into actually running the program. So 
let's just briefly review the execution stack in a second. Okay. So if you look at a process in memory, it consists of local variables. Uh, your stack consists of local variables and your return address. Your heap consists of dynamically allocated variables and your data consists of global variables and your text consists of program code. Okay. So here's a program that I've shown on the left. So I've declared this is a simple C program and I'm going to show you where each one maps to. So your, your globals, so if you look at your int arg, all the orange ones, your float locals, your pointers, um, the return address itself, so this, these things are local to main, um, all of these map to the stack. If you look at your allocated variables, dynamically allocated variables, they map to the heap. And if you look at a global variables, those map to the data segment. So why do we have a heap and a data segment? It has to do with essentially how these are managed. If you look at your global variables, essentially the, the size of each one of them is known as fixed at compile time. So you know how big it is. So you know how big to make a data segment. Heap is essentially used for dynamic data, structures for which you don't know the actual size, and so they have to grow and shrink over time. So both stack and heap grow and shrink over time. Stack is mainly used for local variables, return addresses, and heap is basically used for dynamic variables. Okay. So now let's look at what an execution stack is. So essentially an execution stack uh, in this case the stack, uh, is used to run your program when different functions are called. So in this case, we have a uh, function a here. Um, it branches on an if and calls function b, okay, and then b calls c, and c calls a again, okay. And essentially, this is a form of recursion. And what you have here is that if temp is less than 2, then it uh, it, it, one step reaches to essentially this thing breaks out. So what happens now is the first time, first instance that A is called with one in this case. So you come across, you run function A, it holds the temporary data of temp, and then when it invokes B at this point, you push B onto the stack. So B is running now. So the stack, the current uh, frame record, so this is known as a frame. Okay, so every function that's on the stack has a frame. And the frame record essentially indicates what is the current function that's running in the program. So in this case, so B gets called, B's return address is uh, A plus 2, as you can see. And then C returns to B plus 1. And then finally C calls A, temp equals 2, and return equals C plus 1. And at this point, you're obviously going to break out because the if is going to evaluate to false. Right. So stack essentially holds all the temporary data and the return addresses, and it permits recursive execution. For example, there are two A's on the stack, right, with two different parameters. So it helps to look, notice the difference between these. So both of these are frame records for A, except that they are different because one has temp equals one, the other one has temp equals two. A, B, and C are all procedure names, but also refer in this in this case, return addresses for the procedure code when computing the return address itself. For example, you need to know where to return in A, right? So in this case, I'm, you know, B is going to return to A plus three steps, right? So it's going to get, return to the printf. C, in this case, is going to return to step of B plus one. So it's going to return to the end of B, right? So essentially, it refers to where inside the function that you've got to return to. Okay, so... The next thing we're going to look at is essentially, um, we look at virtual memory in more detail, but briefly what virtual memory does is vend out your physical mem space, so the actual space that you hold things in, your DRAM, to each of these processes. So it takes each of the address spaces or the um, regions in your address space, so it takes the stack, the heap, and the data, and the code, and all of that, and then maps it. Um, it maps it uh, on to the different parts of the physical memory. So in this case, um, um, one second. Okay. So in this case, what it's doing is it's taking the stack of 
process one and then map it onto this part. It uh, takes a stack of process two and then maps it onto another part of the memory, right? And so on and so forth, right? So what is done is taken this physical space and then chunked it up and then vended out chunks to each of the, diff the different parts of each of the processes, right? So you've got the virtual address space, which is what your program perceives and all the data that you're using. This is the physical address space, which is the actual space in your system. So for example, um, you know, if you have four gigs of your program, do you need four, four gigs of memory to actually run? Right? And so this is the actual physical space. The answer is no. You, you, if you have a four gig program, you can still run it on a machine that has only two gigs of memory. I mean, we look at more detail how that happens. Uh, but essentially, a translation pay map is set up. And a translation map guarantees, because it's set up by the operating system, it can guarantee that two parts from two different processes do not overlap. Right? So both the stack of process one, process two, and stack of process one map to different parts of memory. Right? If they map to the same part, then they could clobber each other. But if they map to different parts, then there's no way they're going to overlap. Right? So, so essentially, the operating system guarantees that no two segments from two applications will ever overlap, unless you want it to, which you would only in the case of sharing. So if you've got things like shared libraries, uh, like uh, libc or printer, there's certain common functions that all programs want to use. Only these common functions are mapped to a common segment and each of the segments are mapped to the um, programs. Everything else is mapped to unique spaces on the physical address space. And this guarantees that a separate address space is provided for each process. That is, they don't overlap, they don't cover each other. Okay, so Different processes see separate address spaces. This is good for protection, bad for sharing. And this is where the notion of threads come in. Not every time do you want, you don't want to always separate out uh, processes. Right? What do you want to do? Sometimes you may want to share things. Right? So if you have a program that is, for example, doing matrix multiplication, right? you want data to flow from one thread to another possibly. You have programs that may do pipeline execution. You have things like a browser, right? So you have XML data that's coming in that you're displaying. You want it to flow from the thread that's actually read the XML data to flow in to the display thread, okay? So how do you do that? In this case, if you had each of those separate processes, what you would have had to do is physically copy them. So what you would have had to do is you would have actually had to move, so let's say that you had it in heap two, and you wanted to, so it process two, uh, read the XML data, right? So the XML data came in for process two. That's the uh, thread that processes data, and you want to move it to process one, so which is actually your, you know, it's putting things out onto the screen, right? Um, and so what's going to happen in this case is you would have had to copy from heap two where your XML data came in to heap one. Okay. On the other hand, if heap two and heap one were the same thing, so then you can set up a shared um, you know, let's just call it shared, and then what you would do is take the shared part um, of process two, map it here, you would take another one with process one, map that also here, right? Both of these would map to the same thing. Okay, so all threads in the same process share the same address space, okay? So this is where threads are different from processes. Processes share almost nothing, uh, you, unless explicitly specified. Threads share the heap and everything other than the stack. Only stack, you need a separate stack for each thread so that you could have each thread running a different function, possibly. If you start to share your stacks, then you, you, they would all have to be on the same, um, they would all be running the same function at the same time. Right? So you have a separate stack for each thread, but the heap and everything is shared. Okay? Each thread can access the data of the other threads, this is good for sharing, bad for protection, but you don't care because you actually want each thread to be able to look at the other thread's data. All the I.O. state is shared as well, like your file descriptors. So if you have multiple threads trying to write to the same file at the same time, then it's up to you to control this, okay, and vend it out appropriately. Okay, so let's briefly look at single versus multi-threaded processes. So in this figure, I've shown you a single-threaded process and a multi-threaded process, okay? So, Threads and processes both encapsulate um, 
in some ways they are meant for different things. Threads encapsulate concurrency. So they are an active form of sharing. They pr propose or they put forth active sharing between the different threads in the system. So if you, in the case of threads, you don't share your registers, your stack, so this ensures that each of them could be doing something different. But then all the other stuff, your code, which is essentially all the, the static instructions, all the data, which is all the global variables, all the files, and all the heap, all of the heap is not shown here. I mean, the heap, you know, all the heap as well is shared between all the threads. In terms of processes, there's only one thread that's ever running in a process. So when you say a process, um, in this case, a single threaded process, there's only one thread that's running. And a single thread process, the register stack, there's only one thread. Or, uh, so there's, no, there's only a single register, sing, single set of registers, single stack, code, ha data files, and a heap. Okay, so none of this is shared. Okay. So in some ways, they're used for different things. Threads and capture concurrency, uh, they, they want the threads within a process to actively share the data and be able to see each other's data to be useful for each other. And processes kind of encapsulate memory protection. So the only reason you would run two threads in two different processes if you wanted them to share nothing by default. So if you want if you want to operate in a shared nothing model, shared nothing by default, then you operate in processes. And if you want to operate in the shared everything by default model, then you operate in the, you know, as a multi-threaded process um, with threads instead of processes. By the way, each process should have at least one thread. So this is where at least one man comes in. So each process should have at least one thread to run. So here what we're gonna do is briefly look at the address space of a two-threaded process. In this case, it has two stacks. Both of these go downward. Must make sure that the stacks and the heap do not grow into each other so you don't have, you know, when we spoke about virtual memory protection, making sure that the stacks from two different threads don't clobber each other because they map to different parts. You also have to make sure that two different threads, part of the same process, do not clobber each other. Right? So essentially, you've got to make sure you set up boundaries. And these boundaries are checked. So as the thing keeps going downward, you keep checking if it hit the boundary yet. So on every single movement where the stack keeps growing, you keep checking the boundary. And the operating system essentially sets up this boundary. Okay, so what we're going to do now is essentially, based on what we've learned, classify operating systems into different parts. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, we're going to use this following notion. We're going to use the number of threads and the number of processes, okay, and look at how many threads per process. So if you have uh, a one-to-one -one mapping, So the early uh, Macintoshes were one-to-one -one mapping. Traditional Unix systems were many-to-one. So you had a single thread per process, but you could have lots of different processes. Many-to-one mapping were things like QNX, uh, VxWorks, uh, Java is another example where you have lots of different threads trying to map to a single process in any other system. And then finally, you have more mainstream operating systems, such as uh, Mac OS, uh, Linux, uh, Solaris, OS X, they're all uh, windows, they're all many to many. So you could have lots of different processes, each having lots of different threads. 